football group is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. <laughs> Do you not understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco? And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us? Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome back to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson in our new studio. Sam, what do you think? You're How are you still this loud, even in the new studio? You sitting over there shouting at me. Natural like, excitement. Like you're Paul Burmeister. Natural excitement. Paul, Paul's our inspiration Yeah, back in the day. He was the guy that taught us. No matter how yeah. close you are to the other human, shout at them. It's, it looks ridiculous when you're in person, That's, but on TV... That's, that's what it's supposed to look like. It's a little inside baseball, inside TV. That's hmm. what they call it, inside yeah. baseball. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The people that are sitting right next to each other doing TV are Scream screaming at each, other. at each other. Yeah. And it, and it comes across normal. Uh, we also have every player, every play, every game. Yeah. That's the PFF slogan. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not. Tell me why. Because, uh, you know, this, this was a tagline that we had up on the old website back when it was just a uh, – you know, like a WordPress theme. Um, this is like 2007-ish, 2008? Uh, whenever, yeah, whenever the website went live. I don't think, actually, no. I think it was, I don't know if it was in the original one. But um, it's an old tagline that PFF had, and it is, it's not that. I would like to know what the people think about it. Because I, I think I would go, so you go player, play, game. That does feel out of order. Yeah, it's it is. That's what we have now, though, so we're going to I can't with it. find the original. It's somewhere on my laptop. I saved it specifically for uh, being right when we put it wrong somewhere. Um, oh, here we go. PFF tagline. Open the file. What do we got? To me, it's you start with the game, and then you then it's like, then we're going to hit every player, and we're going to hit every play. File doesn't want to open. I think okay. it's game, player, play. You're taxing my laptop at a time where i From I've, big to small. I uh, forgot the charge. Anyway, we're here. Let's forget about it, Sam. I was trying to have a good conversation here about the PFF tagline. We're here to preview the AFC South. There you go. Every game, every player, every play. So game, player. we have it not even close. Oh, yeah. Everything's out of sequence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we fix this wall real quick? Yeah. I was actually told we cannot fix this wall no. <laughs> at all. We need so to, this uh, is what it is. Also replace, you know, for pro football focus, we need to replace the O with a little old green helmet thing to oh, make it really old school. dead on. We could have a throwback day. Throwback wall. We're here to preview the AFC South. How hard could it be? Mm-hmm. We'll go through each division. Don't forget, we've already gone through the AFC East and the AFC North. Those are in the archives. Let's get to the AFC South. You know what else is weird about the new studio and not being you know, at home and stuff recording these? What's that? you you got to wear pants or yeah. shorts or something that isn't like sweatpants or you know whatever. Whatever you I, had going on below the waist, Steve, over the last few months – Nobody knew. Full disclosure. Now, I haven't worn pants in months. <laughs> now it's all on now. display. Yeah, this is yeah, just a disaster. I requested this shot. I don't like this full body. No, it's rough. I picked up the COVID-19, I think. Yeah? Pounds. Oh, pounds rather than yeah. the disease. Yeah. Because that would have been quite the admission to drop now. No, I picked up some, yeah. some LBs. Yeah, Started I, off great. I, we, were, we were both doing well with the daily basketball at the Y. Yes. And now we have both... You know, Marquise Brown put on 23 pounds in the offseason, right? Good, good weight. I, you know, I don't know where I'm at, but... Bad weight. Yeah. It's bad weight. All right. AFC South. Let's do this thing. Yes. Uh, let's start with the Houston Texans. Okay. Uh, to me, they are one of the most fascinating stories because of a few reasons. You have Deshaun Watson at quarterback. Uh, Watson, throughout his career, hasn't had a great offensive line has had DeAndre Hopkins to throw to and Will Fuller to throw to. And last year, I think they started to show some depth with that wide receiver core. Now, they trade DeAndre Hopkins. But I am as intrigued by this receiving core as maybe any in the NFL. We'll get to that in a minute. So it's Deshaun Watson. What's he going to do without Nuke? And it's, to me, the secondary, again, we circle back to this, the secondary has massive question marks. And this is what the issue was last year with Houston. They looked like a contender one week, 
The next week, they run into a good passing offense, couldn't do anything. That's what happened to them in the playoffs. They couldn't hold a 24 to nothing lead, got torched by the Kansas City Chiefs, and I don't think it was that surprising. It wasn't like, man, this Houston secondary got torched. That's not what we expected. Mm. Um, it was as expected. So what are your high-level thoughts on Houston heading into 2020? Yeah, so uh, the receiving core is obviously the big story, right? And connected to that, the development of Deshaun Watson next year, generally, right? Whether, But in particular, how his development is uh, affected by this change in receiving group. It's, it's not – so obviously anytime you trade away arguably the best receiver in the NFL, it makes you worse. Um, <laughs> Steve's just here texting me asking if we have a cough button. Come and I was, on, dude. I was literally at – just before we I started talking, thinking that we're in this tough spot, right? Because it's all – COVID, one of the big signs is coughing like a maniac. And we, I, you know, I just had a coffee on the way in here. So my entire throat is like needing to. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Just got to clear yeah. it. It's, it's bad because you can't do anything. Don't we, give away all stuck. the secrets here. Yeah, we've I thought I'd killed it. So but apparently cough. you texting makes it flash back up again, further draining my battery, which is inevitably going to die on us. So we don't have a cough button. So none that I can we see. Cannot, it's not taped to the mic anymore. No. We cannot be professional. And um, don't worry. Tyler's yeah. on it next time. We're good. Is that what he said? Yeah, that's what he said. So anyway, anytime you trade away arguably the best receiver in the NFL, or certainly one of, you make your receiving core worse. But they haven't just replaced him with a worse player of a similar style. They have completely changed the style of player across the receiving core, right? They've gone from this, like, you know, a guy whose main talents were physicality, um, are, I guess, he still has them, physicality, contested catch uh, ability, you know, sort of violence in the way he plays receiver and replaced him with guys that emulate Will Fuller, speed, separation, uh, quickness, that aren't, you know, contested catch, uh, uh, physical type guys. So I, I think two things. One, I think that style of receiver is the best style in a vacuum, right? Forget the sort of overall talent level of the receivers if you just have two guys that are basically the same talent, give me the one that's going to win with separation and speed over the guy that's going to win with physicality and you know being bigger than the DB trying to cover him. And two, I honestly think we could see Deshaun Watson's development improve by trading away his best receiver. Really? Yes. It, it sounds dumb. It does. But think of what happened to Matthew Stafford when he lost Calvin Johnson, Megatron, right? Having that guy changes the way you play the game as a quarterback, and I don't know that it's necessarily for the best. It, it certainly you, – you end up with a bunch of plays that look great, right? You're in trouble. When in doubt, heave it in that guy's direction. He's going to come down with it a lot of the time. On the other hand, I don't think that's the smartest way to play the game, right? So in relatively neutral situations, you still lean with, hey, I'm going to fire it his way. And even the best contested catch receivers in the NFL are not winning more than 60% of those plays, right? right? You're actually better off saying, essentially playing the game honestly and throwing it to the guy who's most open on the play. So when Calvin Johnson left, Matthew Stafford's grade skyrocketed. It jumped up because he couldn't just, when in doubt, heave it at Megatron. He had to actually figure out where the open guy was and get him the ball. Deshaun Watson now doesn't have the luxury of – you know, when in doubt, throw the ball at New Hopkins, and he'll probably come down with it. Now he has to work out which one of these fast guys gives me the best chance of completing a pass. Is Will Fuller the most open? Is Brandon Cooks the most open? Is Kenny Stills the guy that's going to be open, assuming he hasn't been arrested again? Um, like, which guy should be getting the ball? I think if you end up playing that way and essentially are determining – you're reading the field and determining which guy is most open. I think that's the best way of playing quarterback. So we might see like this jump forward into Sean Watson's development. Yeah, I mean, it's quite the dissertation on the uh, style Thank you. of receivers and everything. I'm just excited because they all run sub 4-4. <laughs> They're just all fast, Sam. Yeah. Cooks was 4-3-3, Fuller 4-3-2, Stills I think was sub 4-4 or right around it. Um, it's still, at, it doesn't matter. He, yeah, he's sub four four and averages over 15, 15 yards per catch in his career. Yeah, we've we've talked a lot about that, like the sustainability of being a deep threat, a stretch the field type of guy. It's not, it's not high. It's not, it's not easy to do. Stills has been that guy throughout the years. 
I think they're going to be difficult to cover. Cooks, Fuller, and Stills, who you mentioned, and then Randall Cobb, who was, you know, felt like at 30, he felt like it was our age last year. 30, oh, here's this, you know, old mm. Randall Cobb, you know, stumbling into Dallas. He had eight, over 800 yards in the slot last year in the slot. So I think those four, plus Kiki Cutie, who I love. Mm. Um, How much of you loving him is based entirely on his name? Uh, it's about 50-50. Okay. Playing style, too. He's your jet sweep guy. He's your yak guy. When healthy, he's had health issues. And I think that's been part of the issue with Houston as well. When Fuller's been on the field, they've been, it's been a better offense. Yeah. Um, when Cutie's been out there, it adds that other development. And then they don't need to be great at tight end. You know, Darren Fells set a um, career high, I think it was seven or eight touchdowns last year. You have him, Jordan Thomas, Jordan Akins. It's not a great group of tight ends, but it's a group of tight ends that if you're worried about those first four or maybe five receivers, the tight ends, you know, you've got big bodies to throw to in the, t- in the, in the red zone. So it's a, it's a good compliment. Um, I, I don't mind your theory on Watson. You know, like, let's spread it around. Let's take advantage of whoever it is. I don't have a number one. The problem is, though, it is nice having that chain mover. It yeah. is that, that third and eight, <clears throat> I know I can go to DeAndre, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. And it wasn't just – it was like right when Watson stepped on the field. Even in situations when he shouldn't have been thrown to him, he really was. I mean, he was yeah. forcing it to him, and he was the only guy that he had to throw to – for a big chunk of his time, Watson being uh, at quarterback. So um, I am fascinated to see. Here's the other thing, too. It, Watson's – if he's going to take that next step, improvement-wise, he's got to take the easy stuff. He has to take the open throw and not invite as much pressure. We'll talk about the O-line in a minute. The O-line had actually improved a lot last year, especially in pass protection across the board. Watson just held the ball way too long, still takes too many sacks. Maybe if he's not waiting for one guy to get open – and he is more willing to go through his reads a little bit, he will improve that, um, the second read numbers that we get, those next reads when he gets to two and three and four and trust that those guys are going to get open. That could, in year four for Watson, really improve his development. It's, it's the balance of what you talked about, right? How many passes did he throw towards, Deshaun, or the, towards DeAndre Hopkins that shouldn't have been, right. right? When you look at it and you say, he's got a guy draped all over him, I mean, so no matter how good your contested catch guy is, if he has a guy draped all over him, generally there's no separation on the route, the ball probably shouldn't be going his way. Like I said, the best contested catch guys in the NFL catch about 60% of those, and it's not a particularly stable number, right? It fluctuates. So they don't catch 60% every single year. Right. I, I, I forget what Hopkins' number is, but I'm pretty sure it's under 50% for any extended period of time, right? And he's arguably the best contested catch guy in the NFL in terms of what we're talking about. So throwing it towards him on those passes that shouldn't be going to him by separation is a 50-50 play. Now, how much would that improve if instead, if when he looked up and read it, he's like, that guy's not open, I'm finding somebody else, right? That's the question. If yep. that's better than 50-50 on those plays, he will improve by not throwing those passes to Hopkins. Yeah, so I... I mean, I agree. I mean, it, it, and I, I want to see that. I, I, it is one of the things I want to see this year is what Watson looks like back there. Just to remind what happened last year, uh, 19 sacks that we essentially directly put on Watson. Mm-hmm. 19 uh, plus 14 QB hits plus 21 hurries. That's 54 total pressures, including the playoffs. Uh, 10 in the two playoff games and a ton in that Kansas City game that we just said, this is you either holding the ball too long, inviting pressure, drifting in the pocket, inviting more pressure that your line can't block, whatever it might have been. Um, so that is the number. The offensive line last year actually improved a little bit. Laramie Tunsil went from – like he, he was the guy that people s- thought was this elite left tackle, or potentially, and he actually played like that last year outside of the penalties. He did have a ton of penalties, um, but he was really good in pass protection. Uh, one of the – his best season by far. And across the board – they did, a, they did a much better job. Uh, Nick Martin, Max Sharping was a rookie. Titus Howard, rookie, played a little bit. Like all those guys, when I was breaking down this offensive line, they were all same story. Much better in pass protection than they were in the run game. Um, Kansas City was actually the same way. So I think if you're going to be strong, that's where you want to be. The line did improve a little bit last year, but it's going to be them working with Watson, handling pressure, getting the ball out quick. And I think that's where the receiving core can certainly help. Watson also, I'm 
really excited. He's one of the players that I'm most excited to watch this year, right? One, because I'm interested to see what the effect of losing DeAndre Hopkins is. Does it go the way I think it might? But two, I think he's genuinely on the precipice of being like joining that Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes. Like you, you tiered the quarterbacks, right? You yeah. grouped them all into these tiers, and it's essentially a tier of two right now. It's Patrick Mahomes – unquestionably the best quarterback in the NFL. Everybody loves the guy. Everyone, he's incredible. And then Russell Wilson's right up there. And, you know, I was on the Ringer podcast, and, and they asked me, what, happened if, what happens if you switch them, right? If you put Mahomes in Seattle with that Pete Carroll offense, the run-heavy system, and put Russell Wilson in Kansas City with Andy Reid, how far apart do they look? And honestly, I think it's pretty close. Um, but I, I think – you know, you've got Lamar Jackson could join that as well. But I think that Deshaun Watson could join that group with a jump. Um, and if you look at his grades, he's had like back-to-back years of 80, 80, 82. And that's – so Wilson is very similar, except he had the insane grade right out of the gate, right? 2012 as a rookie, his grade was like 90. It's the best season we've ever seen from a rookie. But then after that, he had one, two, three, four, five straight seasons of like – 79 to 83 grading, right? It was yeah. right in that Deshaun Watson was range. He was really good, but wasn't elite, wasn't right up there with the best quarterbacks. And then the last two years has been the new tier one, Russell Wilson. So, and one of the big things that changed is that he was always capable of the high end play, but he kept having these like stinking games every now and again. It's like Russell Wilson's amazing, 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 amazing. Oh, that's bad, Russell. Bad Russell showed up for this game. And the Seahawks didn't win. That's kind of where Deshaun Watson is, right? He's amazing for 80% of the time. And then bad Deshaun Watson shows up and the Texans have no shot. Like if he does what Russell Wilson did and just eliminates those bad games, he's right up there in terms of the Mahomes, the Russell Wilsons, this idea of, you know, he's the Michael Jordan. You're going to regret passing on him. Like he's really close to being in that echelon. So just to put numbers to that, premium stats 2.0, you go in there, you take the quarterbacks. I, I clicked on Watson. I said, okay, what were his first, his four ba- worst games? Mm-hmm. And this is the fun with sample sizes and how things change. If you take out his three worst games, which happen to be week four, 11, and 16, which you can do with hmm. PSV2. How high does he jump? He's a 90.5 There you overall. go. See? So now you can't take out those three games. I mean, this – I. Not to relate it to me again, Sam, but, you know, if you take out my three games. You got drafted. In AAA, when I gave up five runs in less than an inning. Yeah. That was like 15 runs. Like my ERA in the Pacific Coast League goes from about 4-9 to like, you know, 2-9, 9 3 I'm, Not I'm a big all, base. I'm almost to the big yeah, league. Not a big baseball guy, but, get but called up. five runs in an inning doesn't feel good. That's pretty bad. For a pitcher. It's pretty bad. Um, but it's probably right up there with Watson putting up 40s. Yeah. out there so but i mean that's the point like you take away three games it is interesting when you do, when you do the sample size stuff though like patrick if you just take out those three random weeks which are just related to watson right. like mahomes falls to seventh <laughs> brady moves up to eighth and all of a sudden they have like a similar grade i mean it is the funny part about right. you have a 16 this is just the regular season 16 game schedule you take out three of those and it kind of changes things a little bit but i think critically i mean it's basically making my point right but critically i'm not talking about like removing them i'm just talking about what happens if those games graded in the 40s are games graded in the 70s yeah. next year right? well i would i would actually i'm going to view it differently though because we live in the social media world where people love to react to the last thing that they saw uh-huh. so when you saw Deshaun Watson saying week 1 made that incredible comeback against the Saints which they ended up losing but he had like two ridiculous big time throws to lead the comeback. You saw that. It's prime time. It sticks in your head. You're like, this guy's an MVP candidate. And then like the week four game against Carolina where they only scored 10 or 13 points and he was terrible. It's like, ah, no, not a lot of people saw that. But they saw the big game against New England on prime time, his best game of the season. So the perception that Watson is an MVP candidate, I think is true. But for him to, him to actually reach that, to your point, he needs to eliminate some of those bad games. But people have seen his best stuff. His fourth quarter stuff mm. has been incredible. The best passer rating plus PFF grade last year, I believe, in the fourth. So, yeah, just have to eliminate some of those, some of those bad games. I mean, yeah, I think he is right up there. There's a common theme to all these bad games. Like, if you look at them, <laughs> Carolina, 160 passing yards. Uh, and then, what, 184 against Tampa Bay and 169 against Baltimore. Now, Baltimore is one of the best defenses in the NFL, and Tampa Bay did have late in the season, so those are two of the better defenses he's faced. But, like, if he just goes from being completely ineffective and terrible in those games to being average, we are talking yeah. about a guy that's in that 
Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson level. And that's re- I think that's exciting. 2018 was the same thing, though. He had two games under 40. Yeah. One was at uh, Washington. One was against Buffalo. Both graded in the 30s. Multiple fumbles. It was just ugly. It, did, it, it wasn't terrible statistically, but like the actual play was poor. So anyway, there's some room to improve for Watson, which right. I think is exciting. For Talk Texas to me fans. about this defense because it's ugly. Yeah, I'm afraid, of, I'm afraid of the secondary. You know, I do Houston radio every week, and last year – I felt like I was a, you know, broken record saying, you know, like, you know, should we be more excited about Houston after this win? Like, mm. not really. I don't trust the second, <laughs> you know, I don't trust them back there. Yeah. Um, it, this is one of those, the same what you talked about, the Jets offensive line and all these other teams with what ifs. Here's the what ifs for the Texans in their secondary. Uh, Gary and Conley looked good after they got him in man coverage. You know, mm-hmm. when he was playing just man, his zone man splits are just absurdly, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum. If you are going to play more man coverage, he's been pretty good there. Made a ton of plays on the ball over the last couple of years. Uh, Bradley Roby has been a solid player at points in his career. If you're just talking like a one-two punch, that's not a disaster. The problem last year is you saw a lot of play from Lonnie Johnson as a rookie. That was just terrible. Uh, Vernon Hargraves came over. The reclamation project, man, he's one of my guys too. I just always wanted to believe in, but he just he hasn't played well. Outside in the slot, hasn't played well anywhere. Uh, Justin Reed's been a solid Safety, they bring in Eric Murray to kind of play a slot uh, safety role. Um, it's just not great. And I, here's the issue, I think, with the Texans. They are one of those teams that's been playing whack-a-mole with their roster. Mm. They've been trying to shore up this thing here, and they've let this other thing fall. They have spent so many resources with little draft capital. They haven't had draft capital since trading up for Watson. Plus, they've made some poor deals. Mm-hmm. They've been trying to fix the offensive line with all their draft capital recently that they haven't been able to invest in the secondary. And that's what's come back to haunt them last year, and it might again this year. That'd be my concern here. Yeah, we didn't even mention the backfield, the David Johnson, Duke Johnson thing, which has the potential to be kind of exciting. If David's back to form, yes. And if Duke, we talk about this kind of like offline, our fantasy guys love Duke Johnson, Johnson because everybody, we're all working with the same numbers at PFF. Yeah. If you look at like missed tackles per carry, missed tackles after the catch, yards after contact, like Duke, it's like Nick Chubb and all these great and Derrick Henry, and it's like Duke Johnson's listed near the top in all of these things. Now, he's always been a change of pace guy, he's never been a high volume guy, but man, get that guy more touches. The fact that both of these guys are that their calling card for both of them is the work in the passing game, I think is is a very good thing, right? Yeah. The fact that David Johnson has not been the player that he was when he signed that contract. And that's fairly, you know, it's, it's important to understand that that's very much tied to the blocking that's been in front of him. And Houston's blocking is unlikely to be that great is a problem. The further fact that you like actually went out of your way to acquire that by trading away your best offensive weapon is not good. I mean, it's, it's, it's inexcusable. <laughs> I guess you say it as it is. There's no, there's no justification for that. This was a contract the Cardinals are trying to get rid of. And not only did you facilitate them getting rid of that, but you ch- threw in your best <laughs> offensive weapon to make it happen. Like, that's just bad. There's no way of getting around that. But it has the potential to be exciting. All that speed at receiver, the two running backs that are both really important parts of the, the passing game as well. Again, this all bodes well for, like, Deshaun Watson. My, my problem on defense, so that my point bringing up that was, was actually, like, they put themselves in a tough bind with the Deshaun Watson thing, but they've, like, further dug that hole deeper. Oh, by, I agree. Yeah, by they, not, haven't, you know, they haven't played it well. Right. You, like, you could have thrown your resources at better places, and you haven't. Uh, uh, the defense thing, the thing that jumps out to me is there's a bunch of players that, like, have shown really good play in the past yeah. and right now are not necessarily anywhere near that. And they need, like, two or three of them to get back to that quickly. So J.J. Watt feels like 2014, 2015 J.J. Watt again. This is, you know, your preseason stories. I feel like I did when I was Defensive Player of the Year. I mean, he wasn't a million miles away from that last year before he tore his pack or whatever it was he injured. Right. If he gets back to being, you know, the best J.J. Watt, that's obviously huge. But maybe the more important part is if Whitney Merciless goes back to being like a, a legitimate foil on the other side. When Whitney Merciless was, you know, looked like worth the first round pick, you know, was a legitimate second, uh, second tier, I guess, pass rusher, a guy that was going to get you 60 pressures, have a good uh, pass rushing grade, i.e. was winning on his own merit. That's huge to have on the opposite side. If he's not doing that and it's just J.J. Watt, that's not enough. And then on the back end, 
they need Bradley Roby to be the guy that was part of the no-fly zone, you know, could hold up in man coverage on his own outside, even if it's only against number twos, and be like a legitimate force. Like, Roby hasn't been that guy for a number of years either. So I think in an ideal world, both of those guys get back to being at their best play, but I think they need one of them to. Just from a ranking standpoint, again, when we were ranking secondaries, I was thinking anybody between 25 and 32 was almost interchangeable with, with those secondaries. We right. put them at 25. I mean, they were right there. The Indianapolis Colts, who we'll talk about, they don't have great names. The, it's a lot of AFC South here, to be honest. Um, three teams in that bottom seven um, because there's just not a lot of guys that you can rely on. Um, to your point, have they done it before? Sure. Could they get back to that point? Sure. But um, it's going to take a lot. I also The linebackers I like a lot. Zach Cunningham is well, hashtag fun to watch. Plays the run really well. Hasn't been great when you when he gets isolated one-on-one against backs. Same thing with Bernardrick, uh, Bernardrick McKinney. So the entire back seven is just, you know, they, they get exploited. They yeah. had a couple good games. They had a great game against Gardner Minshew in London and this and that like against the Jags. But it's like they're one-offs here and there against offenses that aren't that great. Um, my concern is when they're going up against the best teams in the AFC, how are they going to match up? And so they need... They need something to come together there. To your point on the defensive line, too, they also lose DJ Reader. They've slowly lost talent along the defensive line, and that's why in the draft, didn't have a first-round pick because of Tunsil. They bring in Jonathan Grenard in the third round, Ross Blaylock in the second round, guys that both probably need some development or just – Blacklock. Grant. Blacklock. What did I say? Blaylock. Blaylock. Yeah, Blacklock. Ross Blacklock. He's great to watch, too. Low, low pad level, TCU guy, but, like – Man, they they need some help up front as well. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, one way of you know patching up these rosters is if you start hitting on these low or mid round picks that sure. you're left with. Um, the guy that I think could actually make an impact for them pretty quickly is John Reed, cornerback from Penn State. Um, I think he's a natural slot guy, and they haven't had anyone covering the slot that's capable. Right, like Vernon Hargreaves. That wherever you put him in the NFL hasn't worked, so that that didn't go well um, I think John Reed has the skills to be an NFL slot cornerback if they strike on him in the fourth round and suddenly you've got like a viable slot corner like that I mean that changes a lot so I I like the Texans to compete in the how hard can it be AFC South obviously <laughs> they've got the best quarterback in the division I think it's pretty clear yeah um, unless Tannehill plays like he did last year but some questions mm -hmm. in important spots let's move on to the Indianapolis Colts uh I think the story of the Colts has been Chris Ballard, been there for a few years now, completely reshaped this roster. They were, we've talked about this quite a bit, you know, they spent all that draft capital and money to bring in DeForest Buckner, but they've been waiting to spend this money because they've right. just built so much through the draft. This is the opposite of what Houston has done with lesser, with fewer draft picks in Houston. Indianapolis, since 2018, is just loading up on homegrown talents they've added guys like justin houston to you know sprinkle in uh, along the edges but it's mostly a, a young team that's that's very much homegrown and it feels like they they should be there now like this is yeah. their time to compete and you know i think jacoby Brissett held them back last year so this is where philip rivers coming in has a chance to make a little playoff push yeah i mean this it's all about philip rivers right what does he have left um We've re he's in that area of quarterback. Eli Manning's already gone. Ben Roethlisberger's coming back injured and not off his best play. Phillip Rivers coming off his worst season for a long time. What does that group of quarterbacks have left? And Rivers is, like we talked about last time, he's one of those quarterbacks that over the years has taken a beating, right? He's not protected himself, if you like, in terms of um, just wear and tear. He's suffered a lot. So I don't know that you – so – you take him out of, I was going to say San Diego. You take him out of the Chargers. Um, you remove him from one of the, from consistently one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. Like his entire career, they haven't been able to put a good offensive line in front of him. And that's been part of the problem. So you've solved that problem because you're taking him from one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL to one of the best in the Colts. But you're also taking him away. You're downgrading a receiver, I think. So the, the Chargers for years, they've consistently had a, a good group of receivers. Indianapolis is, is a question mark. Obviously, you've got T.Y. Hilton, but after that, it's second-round rookie Michael Pittman. I think that's a huge pick for them, but it actually needs to pan out the way everyone think it will, thinks it will. 
And then Paris Campbell, last year's first round pick, needs to become something, right? At that reports coming out of camp. I'm sure. Yes, I have no trouble believing that that guy looks like a superstar in training camp against air, you know, uh, without defenders having to, to be concerned about. It. But anyway, like, so Rivers downgrades at receiver, upgrades at offensive line, new environment for the first time. Like, just generally, what does Phillip Rivers look like? Because I think this is a roster that was a quarterback away from contending, but did they, like, did they get the quarterback that makes that change? Let me discuss Rivers for a minute here. Because all, all valid points. Love the offensive line we've ranked as the best, and I think that's good. It, I can't wait to see Rivers not with the walls caving in, right? right? People love to just create stories, especially with older quarterbacks. And as soon as you see something bad, it's like, all right, it's over. You would never do that, but other people do, hmm. okay? So Rivers threw some ducks last year. It's not the first time he's thrown ducks. No. So let's just put it into perspective. Last year, we gave him a 74.3 overall grade. He has graded that low before. Yeah. I think, though, there was one game in there, though, the Miami game. He just torched Miami. It was early in the season when they couldn't cover anybody. He had, like, a 95 grade. So just for the sake of – because sometimes people see stuff, and they're not wrong, but they also forgot the Miami game. So I'm like, let me just eliminate the Miami game. So that actually shaves, like, five points off his grade. He's like a 69-something, <laughs> right? Because right. he was so good in that Miami game. But it's like, all right, what? That was against the SEC, you know, hmm. essentially. So what if he had a 69 grade? Has he ever done that before? Yes, he actually did it in 2015. He's had some bad seasons. And he did it in 2012. Philip Rivers has fallen off the old man cliff like four <laughs> times in yeah. his career. And here's my point. He's bounced back pretty much every time. Like 2012 was his worst season, and it wasn't even close. This was end of North Turner, 64.1 grade. They needed a shakeup. They needed something new. He comes back with an 88. His best season in a while in 2013. New regime. They got the ball, rid of the ball quicker, all this good stuff, right? 2015 and 16, he had a 69 grade and a 70 grade. 17, he bounced back. In 18, there was a point where he was actually in the MVP conversation, 88.9 overall grade. I mean, it was Mahomes MVP that year, but I'm, right. like Rivers was really good. They beat the Chiefs down the stretch. Rivers going head-to-head with Mahomes, right? That was just 2018. So last year, he threw some ducks. He threw 20 picks. Like, he's done that before. So, again, we always talk about young players. They don't just, like, they start here, they get better, they get better. Old guys don't just get worse, get worse, get worse. Rivers has had these ebbs and flows at other times in his career. If he's going to be rejuvenated, it's behind this nice offensive line, indoor environment. Yes, the playmakers need to develop a little bit. It's not the same group he had in Los Angeles. But I'm not ready to write off Philip Rivers because he threw some ducks last year. He's been doing that for, like, 10 years. Right. I don't. You don't write him off, but at some point – like every time that happens, he's older than the last time, right? So now he's 38. And at know, some don't point, don't go philosophizing on I'm just here. saying, at some point, like the fact that he's an old man is going to weigh against his chances of bouncing back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I just, not everybody is Tom Brady. Like 38 right. is old for a quarterback. I'm just and saying most it's of those lazy guys, to just say, well, I saw that is. bad pass. You lost your arm. You're old. It's over. It is. He's lazy. also, he is intriguing because he's never delivered the ball in a normal way. True. Like he's got that shot putt delivery. And, like, what does that do to a guy who's aging and losing arm strength, right? Like, it's a weird delivery in the first place. Does that suffer more or less or the same when Father Time comes knocking and starts taking away some arm strength? Like, does the fact that you throw the ball like a shot putt, like, mean that you fall off a cliff harder than some of these other guys or less or not even at all because you've always delivered the ball in a weird way? doesn't so, matter when you have that kind of dad strength right. like he has. There's a bunch of weird things going on with Philip Rivers. All I'm saying is it's like that's the question mark for the Colts, right? Is what what the hell does Philip Rivers look like in 2020 because they put this guy on a roster believing that they're good enough for him to take them to the playoffs and, and make some noise. Yeah, so back to the playmakers again. T.Y. Hilton's been really good. Needs Michael Pittman to be that big body yeah. receiver that he's always loved. I think the pressure's off Paris Campbell from being that special, like from being that true like speed number one guy would have let him be the gimmick player as long as Pittman's good yeah you know if Pittman's good he could be the speed um you know mix it up player Jack Doyle Trey Burton if he's healthy at tight end it's not a terrible group of playmakers but it's certainly in the bottom third of the league um as far as going into the year and question marks Trey Burton's a really interesting one because yeah. obviously he signed the decent deal in in Chicago it was sort of based off you know the limited sample size in Philadelphia where he was pretty spectacular on like 250 snaps 
Obviously, things didn't work out in Chicago. Injuries, <laughs> Trubisky. Um, but he's the kind of guy I could easily see having a resurgence in a new environment, you know, with, with all the pressure off him now as a big signing. Like they're now, also Now he's just an afterthought. They're going to be running the ball a lot. That'll help, yeah. They've got Marlon Mack, who is – he's, again, been very quietly efficient since entering the league in 2017. Behind a great offensive line? How strange is that? Yeah, hmm. behind – well, the line's better now, too. With Quentin Nelson, best guard yeah. in the league. Anthony Costanzo, a left tackle, really good. So Mack runs well. Jonathan Taylor was probably the best all-around runner in the draft. Run zone, gap, does it all. He's got some speed, despite what hmm. Eric said that one time. He's got some speed. <laughs> That's right, Wisconsin guys. We know he can run fast in a straight line. No, but Jonathan Taylor, you know, they have two workhorse type of backs. Now, are they going to give it to him Wilkins. too much? Maybe, but what's that? Three if you count Wilkins. He's that yeah. kind of style anyway. Yeah, and then to me it's just a pass game there. Naheem Hines has been, has been really – he's caught 107 passes over the last two years. The rest of them have graded – Pretty poorly. Max been horrendous grade wise. Right. I mean, as Hines. Far as goes. Yeah, Hines is drawing the obvious comparisons to Austin Eckler, right? Eckler is spectacular the last couple of seasons with Philip right. Rivers. Does Philip Rivers turn Naheem Hines into Indianapolis' version of Austin Eckler? I mean, Taylor could catch a check down and get, you know, do some things too. I mean, that's a lot of Rivers' stuff isn't just screen game. It's, you know, he, he, he takes the check down when it's there. So sure. there's some potential with this offense. Yeah. Um, defensively, They've been an interesting case study as well because as I'm putting these rankings together, they're not going to be high in the secondary, but they play so much zone. They play a lot of cover two, cover three, you know, quarters. They play – they mix it up on the back end. That's when you don't need it, you know, the best name talent. However, again, at some point you're going to face the Chiefs. You're going to have to stop the Ravens. You know, if you're going to make a run in the AFC, you have to stop some of these really good passing offenses – so having names and having talent helps. I have the same concerns in the Colts secondary. As much as they've reshaped this roster, TJ Carey, they bring in Xavier Rhodes, Rocky Asin. So they've got questions. I, they, they lost a guy to an opt-out that I'm really bummed uh, isn't going to be playing. Marvell Tell yes. isn't playing. I thought he had a chance to take a step this year, become – like him and Rocky Sin as their sort of two outside corners, young, talented, physical, size. Like those guys have the ability to, to make that a really interesting secondary. Now, no Marvel Tell, it's just Rocky Sin. What does Xavier Rhodes look like this year? I mean, he was abysmal last season. Like it's, we've. I Do you think, have his numbers handy? Yeah. I and mean, we've always been a little bit lower on Xavier Rhodes than most people, but last season was ridiculous. Like, his overall PFF grade was 46.4. Now, that's bad, right? But it's somehow that was better than his numbers. His right. coverage numbers were worse. He gave up, as a perimeter cornerback, 84.3% of the passes thrown his way were caught. That's that, tough to do. Like, that's not a bad number for, like, throwing against air. Like, throwing an actual corner trying to stop you doing that is a whole different world. He gave up four touchdowns. He gave up a passer rating of 127.8 and had 10 penalties. So, like, 10 penalties made those numbers better than they would have been if he hadn't had the penalties. That's right? our own fault. We should factor those in into the numbers. You can't, though. It's like, what is – so, defensive pass interference, you could put, like, to the point, but what about the next well, what, 15 yards of run after the catch? I mean, you could – it wouldn't be a true whatever. reflection. If they accept the penalty, it's whatever the yards are. Just that yardage? Yeah. yeah. We could calculate it. You could, but, but it's not like a – it's not a like for like. Either way, he was – so let me ask you this. Either way, those numbers are – like his grade – like those numbers fl – or his grade flatters those numbers, and those numbers flatter his actual performance because of 10 penalties on top of that. Right. Uh, will he – if they play a ton of cover two, and when we say a ton, we're talking like 28, 30%. It's <laughs> right. not like you – hide there the whole time nobody's playing lovey smith tampa two every play anymore right like can, how much can you protect him um i don't mind taking shots on him josh oh, yeah. norman we mentioned on the afc east one like that's fine but you need to have a backup plan yeah. um and you know they got rock but i'm with you on the marvel tell thing I, I think it's really fascinating when teams have a style and it, uh, mike renner's said this quite a bit when they when he reviews the colts draft uh, drafts they have a very unique style they've gotten linebackers uh, Darius Leonard Bobby Okariki really long 
you know, just guys that are going to, when they play zone, they're going to crowd passing lanes and get their hands on passes in theory. Marvell Tell, safety to corner conversion like that. Mm -hmm. I am fascinated by those guys in general, especially trying to steal a valuable corner somehow by yeah. a guy that didn't do it in college and just has the frame. And so, like, I am just fascinated by that. Um, and that's been the Colts, you know, just trying to steal value here and there. And actually, they kind of identify guys that I don't think the rest of the league – they value guys higher than maybe the rest of the league does. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that they have a style and they're sticking to it. And um, I always in, uh, it's always interesting to me. Um, they also need help from recent picks like Ben Vanigu. Um, who else was that up front that I'm just uh, losing his name from before? But they bring in DeForest Buckner. Kamoko Tarai has been a pretty good pass rusher when healthy. Well, his numbers really. were insane last year on like – the 90 snaps they were the insane first few games before he got hurt. If he's on the field, the guy gets after the quarterback. Like, there's potential there up front with Buckner in there, with Justin Houston still in there at the bo bottom end of his uh, end of his career. Banigou's the guy I was thinking of, but he's been kind of a hybrid edge, can play a little bit of linebacker. Like, they've got some some guys that can move around up front. Terai is also really intriguing because they have on staff uh, Robert Mathis like coaching him up as Similar. a pass rush specialist. And yeah. if you think about one guy who knows how to like, as a two, as a sort of 250 or smaller pound edge rusher knows how to get it done. Like that was Robert Mathis. There may be no better, you know, undersized pass rusher in NFL history than Robert Mathis or like Robert Mathis has been teaching Kamoko Tarai how to use his hands, how to, you know, how to do all this stuff. And through like three games last season, his numbers were insane. I mean, look, it's it's a, a long shot to be leaning on it as like a reason you're going to be good, but don't be surprised if Kamoko Tarai is all of a sudden really good this year. They definitely have some e intriguing names between him, as mentioned, Buckner, Sheldon Day's in there, Houston, if depending on what he has left. So, look, I think the word solid comes to mind when it's the Colts. The secondary, on paper, not solid, but when you put them in that scheme, protect them a little bit, they can get by. Um, Either way, I think they're going to be a tough team to beat. Yep. They're going to be dependent on, as we mentioned, Phillip Rivers. Eh, that's the answer all the time. It's always going to be the quarterback. But, you know, Rivers could really be rejuvenated in this situation. And by the way, they now go back to having one of the best backup quarterbacks in the NFL. And Jacoby. Jacoby Brissett. So, yeah. look, if maybe Phillip Rivers goes down, misses a couple of games, your season isn't toast anymore yeah. because Jacoby Brissett can come in and, you know, be bad. Here's the thing with Brissett, right? Last year – our grades, he was graded like around the 60s, but he still had like 100 passer rating. We were like, this is going to catch up. It did down the stretch. And look, a lot of people, I, there's a lot of NFL analysts out there that love Jacoby Brissett. And anytime you see starter caliber plays, you're like, this guy's a starter. But we keep coming back to like the NFL right now. How tough is it to find a Jacoby Brissett? Right. You know, he's probably QB 32, 35? Yeah. In the NFL, like, like in the NFL right now? So. He's a high-end backup. He's Case Keenum. For yeah, he's in that range for the rest of his career, which is good. It's valuable, but I'm not building my team no. around him. I'm always going to look for something else. He does a lot of things well, but the things that he does badly are fatal flaws in terms of being like a quality starting NFL quarterback. So the Colts had to move on. But you, if you have that guy as a backup, you're in a pretty good shape because yes. he does a lot of things well. And the things that he does badly, if you only have to worry about them for like two, three weeks, oh, yeah. you can hide them. You can manage that for sure. All right, let's move on. Jacksonville Jaguars. Yes. A couple years removed mm. from the AFC Championship. Right. Feels like we're back in full rebuild mode here. Yeah. I mean, look, at, look at this roster and remind yourself how close they were to the Super Bowl that like that short a period ago in 2017 they had Jalen Ramsey you know in his second season they had AJ Boye looking great opposite him so now great got, secondary loaded defensive line I mean just look at the like list the names and then there were the current replacements so Jalen Ramsey and AJ Boye has become DJ Hayden and like Trey Herndon up yeah. front they just had everybody in 2017. Now the only guy left is Yannick Ngakwe, who hasn't been as good as he was in 2017. Everyone else has left. Like, I think the reality was, though, they weren't as good as their record that year because they were dependent on defense. Mm. There was, it was a defense that was like facing Blaine Gabbert from Arizona. Like it was, that was one of those defenses unsustainable yeah. situations. And Blake Bortles like, wasn't that good that year. They just, you well, know. Yeah, managed, that's, I mean, that's, that's why they weren't as good, right, is that – Ultimately, it was all based on the foundations of Blake Bortles, and that was inevitably going to crumble into disaster. 
I, I think this is just a perfect example of how it, this idea of, you know, well, the, the old cliche of defense wins championships. Like, it can, but you need to assemble a defense that looks like that, and it's almost impossible to keep that for any period of time. And that, I think, is what we've seen right now. They've sort of aided in the, the dismantling of it, you know, in terms of trading guys away and whatever. But, like, you, you can't pay all these guys, right? So you can assemble a defense like that for one run, and that in and of itself is difficult. But it's, it's impossible to keep them around because next year this guy is going to go looking for more money. The year after that, this guy's going to want more money, so you got to trade him away. And it just, it, piece by piece, it disintegrates. So It also naturally regressed in sure. 2018 as well. Yeah, but I think this defense, I think that defense was genuinely, you know, one of the best defenses we've seen in a long, long time. It's right up there with those Denver Broncos teams, those uh, Seahawks teams. But A, that is really hard to sustain year on year. And B, personnel-wise, it's just impossible to keep together for any period of time. A lot of people are expecting the Jags to be in the conversation for the number one pick. It can't be, though, because Minshew. That's what I was going to say. Is he not? You know, is he tank proof? He's like he's like he's a modern day Fitz. Yeah. yeah, we just yeah, talked ourselves into the same answer. He really is. Like, no, you know what? He's not Fitzpatrick because Fitz, Fitzpatrick is the answer to the question of what would it look like if Brett Favre had gone to Harvard and had somehow lost all of his physical tools. Had no arm. <laughs> right. That is Ryan Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Right. He, but Minshew isn't that. Minshew has got much better accuracy than Fitzpatrick. He's got a few traits that are similar, right? He's got, for a start, the weird, you know, Ray-Bans and Jorts thing going on. That's quite Fitz-like. Yes. Um, so, Doesn't have good velocity And at all. facial hair. Right. Also has a similar caliber noodle. But I think is significantly more accurate, is significantly less YOLO-prone. Oh, you know what we should do? We should put, because football velocities are all over the place and they're kind of stupid. Uh -huh. But we should just make up our own like baseball related velocity for quarterbacks. Just give them a miles per hour number. Yeah, like if if Josh Allen's like 103. Right. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, Mahomes is like 98 or 99. He contends that's different. The way. Well, whatever. He still wants to set up that throwing competition. Prove, I think prove pure it's strong. Velocity is going to be Allen. Yeah, even the throwing competition Mahomes is like distance. He's not winning a like throw it through a brick wall contest oh, distance, with Josh for Allen. Sure. Yeah, but there's but that's the difference between pitching and football too like you have to have all different types of throws you've yeah. got crow hop deep ball to Tyree kill of course you've got you know all these different things um of course but like ryan fitzpatrick on that scale yeah Low if, if josh allen's throwing 100 fitzpatrick's throwing like 84 okay i think Minshew's throwing like 84 yeah 84 85 arm strength wise are in the same ballpark but Minshew is significantly more accurate with it and significantly less yolo like than than fitzpatrick um, I think they look similar in terms of uh, the sort of ad-libbing, running around the pocket, trying to do crazy things that they're probably not physically capable of, you know, it, it, trying to be the sort of hyper-athletic quarterback that neither of them really is. Right. But I think— It works sometimes for both of them, though, too. It's like, oh, look yeah. at this. Fitz just ran 18 yards for a touchdown. Minshew was doing the same thing. I think Minshew will dial down his frequency of that once he gets more comfortable with the speed of the NFL. I think that is a— manifestation of this thing you talk about of you know rookies the game's going too fast for them and they yeah. hold on to the ball too long they get themselves into trouble and then it's just instinct at that point i think when he's in the system year two year three he will dial down the amount of that he does whereas fitzpatrick that's just what he does like so, so i think Minshew didn't actually make bad throwing decisions last year 38 percent of his turn turnover worthy plays a huge amount were on fumbles we're right. on those like you said make too much happen yeah. late in the play he didn't make bad decisions like misreading linebackers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's encouraging. I think he has the capability. Like the things that he was bad at last year, I think will get better because they're young. They're young quarterback flaws. They're things that you know the young quarterbacks struggle with because of that transition. But I think he actually has a good shot of getting a lot better. The problem is, like, how much better can he get? Right? Like, I don't. Right. I don't think even the most Minshew loving of Stan thinks that this guy is like an all-pro quarterback down the line. Here's what I'm most impressed about. The biggest question mark for the Jags going into the season was how is Nick Foles, how is Nick Foles going to succeed without a good supporting cast? Yeah. We've seen him succeed with the 2013 Eagles and a fresh Chip Kelly offense. Good guys to throw to. We've seen him succeed on a playoff run with a great group of receivers and tight ends. How is he going to succeed? Throwing to DJ Chark, Chris Conley. Chark wasn't even a thing 
until he emerged last year. So good for Chark, Chark but at the same time, I look at it from a macro view, and I'm like, Gardner Minshew took one of the worst groups of playmakers yeah. and turned an offense and made it pretty good. Like, he actually made it viable. He helped DJ Chark look good. He's throwing to Chark, and Chris Conley, D.D. Westbrook, LaVisca Chenault's the wild card as the second-round rookie and all that stuff. But that was what I was most impressed about with Minshew. Bad supporting cast, not a great offensive line, rookie sixth rounder. Like, you should have zero chance. And he was grading as well as Daniel Jones and Kyler Murray and all the other rookies. Like, he was right there with those guys. He has the worrying potential for this franchise to be just at the level to put them into quarterback purgatory for a long time. Like, he might end up developing into being just good enough that it's really difficult to, like, get rid of him for somebody. But – not good enough to actually like make a material difference to everything around him in terms of like dragging a crappy roster to the playoffs or whatever. You know, like Andrew Luck was capable of sort of dragging a pretty ropey Indianapolis team to the postseason almost regardless of what was around him. I don't know that Minshew's ever going to get to that level, but he might be good enough to win like seven games. Every, he's like the Jeff Fisher of quarterbacks like he might be good enough to get you to seven wins every single year at which point it becomes a real pain in the ass to replace him could he be why can't he get better though could he be better than that? that's what i'm saying i think he can get better from where he is and get them to like a consistent level of seven eight wins every year but i don't know that he'll get better than that you think he can get better than that i mean he was really good last year without much around him so but the question is so can he become a pro bowl all pro caliber quarterback no, nah, probably not. Right. Probably not. So if he's the step just below that, that's a horrible place to be. No, I know. Does he settle into that high-end backup role? So, I mean, yeah, that, that basically ends up being okay. Andy Dalton. Can he be Kirk Cousins? Kirk Cousins. <sighs> What's to keep him from being Kirk Cousins? I mean, Cousins has way more arm talent than Minshew. I understand. Dude, he was the number three grade on 20-plus yard throws last year. Sure. We spend all this time in the draft process talking about arm strength, and arm strength does matter. But that's not where but it not matters. not in the right area. Right, but yes. I'm just saying it's just funny because people are, oh, arm strength, you could drive the ball down the field, you could flip the field, you could do this and that. Yeah. It's like, no, you just got to be accurate and on time, and that's what Minshew was. His timing, anticipation, and accuracy down the field was spectacular last year. I have, like, arm strength should not be ever connected with the deep ball. Just in people's no, brains, it should be of completely course. disassociated with that. Arm strength only matters, and I'm really not a particularly big arm strength guy, but arm strength only matters in that intermediate level where you need to fizz the ball into tight spaces. Um, I, so maybe Andy Dalton is a better comp, right? Yeah, that's fair. Does he settle into being an Andy Dalton, at which point you need to craft the 2015 Bengals around him for him to be really good and have a shot at anything. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's not a great place to be. It's not. If you have to if you have to build that way. Anyway. Um I was just looking at the numbers. He's completed twenty six of fifty nine at twenty I didn't do the no play filter. <laughs> I was just gonna say Josh Allen's got like almost a hundred more attempts. Why you gotta do that? Down why, the field. Why you gotta why you gotta be the Josh Allen hate on twenty plus. Why? Why? Every, every week. Anyway, what every are we week. looking for with the Jets? The offensive line's not great. Uh, they have not gotten their money's worth, really, from Andrew Norwell at left guard. Cam Robinson's never developed like people think he should. Uh, Juwan Taylor was okay as a rookie right tackle. I mean, the offensive line, where do we rank these guys? Where'd the Jags rank? Nice. O-line, 26th. Running backs, 31st. Wide receivers, 32nd. You know, the tight ends, tw- 24th. Yeah. It's not good. It's not good, Steve. It's not good. I mean, this, this is a roster that should be shooting for the number one overall pick. This is a roster Minshew's that should— Minshew's going to screw it up. Right, that should be in the Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields sweepstakes and won't be because Minshew's too good. The other curious part, I'd say, let's go defensive side of the ball. Miles Jack, when you go back to that 2017 defense, it seemed perfect, right? You've got this yeah. incredible pass rush. You had three corners who could cover. You had pretty good safeties. And then it's like Miles Jack was on the verge of emerge, of becoming that next great coverage linebacker and all that stuff. He was a disaster last year, completely lost at times. They had one of the worst – they had the worst coverage grade among linebackers as a as team last year. But if Jack gets back to form, they add Joe Schobert to the mix. He's been one of the better coverage linebackers. He's, they paid a lot of money for him, but he's been fantastic um, for today's NFL, the way he plays. I think the defense has a few pieces to at least, you know, point toward the future this is like the Jags 2013 14 15 
when they kept bringing in talent and it's like, give us a couple more years and we'll be tough and viable and difficult to play. Yeah. Um, That's what you're looking for, I think, as a Jags fan this year. Is Miles Jack the best running back on this roster? Oh, you're going to make the same point again? Oh, yeah. Actually, he is, though. He really, he really might be. That's Chris Thompson. Oh, uh, yeah. I forgot Chris Thompson, Thompson was there. there. Fournette caught like 100 passes last year. Realistically, it was like 70-something. I still can't. I mean, could you, the idea that somebody paid the fourth overall pick for Leonard Fournette in today's NFL is, is mind-blowing. Um, th- what do you make of the defense generally in terms of – so they're, like, their whole draft it was – like, let's take these talented, toolsy guys that need some work. Like, Caleb Von Chason, C.J. Henderson. They've gone for these sort of high upside athletes that aren't – I mean, even if they work out, they're not going to work out year one, right? I don't know what, if What are they doing? I, I think a lot of people – people view – We our view is different. People viewed C.J. Henderson as – the, potentially the number one corner. A lot of p- teams had C.J. Henderson, Henderson as the number one corner on their board with Oku, Okuda right there, one and two. We had yeah. Okuda pretty clearly. Our grades clearly said Okuda, and they said, hey, Henderson's close until 2019 happened, and he, it was a small sample size, and he wasn't great against some really good competition. But people had Henderson up there with Okuda. I don't think that's crazy, and given – the crazy nature of projecting cornerbacks. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, they went with this unbelievable upside guy. Like, the NFL pretty much agreed there. I think with Chase on, we've been much better at predicting pass rush performance. And Chase on ranked like 70th or whatever in the class in pass rush grade. And he definitely has some snaps that look like Von Miller. And I'm like, man, that's awesome. But that's what you're – you are banking on upside and, you know, that hitting there. Um, he's a good player. I would just take him in the second, Chase on. They took him late first. I would take him in the second. There's better players out there, especially the receiving core that needs to be overhauled in Jacksonville and built around DJ, DJ Chark. Um, yeah. So there's some upside guys in Chase on and Henderson. I mean, the defense generally, it's a, it's a weird unit. Like, they've got those kind of guys. They've got Miles Jack, who needs to rebound. Yannick Ngakwe, who we said hasn't been as good since 2017. Doesn't want to play there. Right. Josh Allen needs to take that step forward as their elite number one pass rusher. Taven Bryan hasn't really been the player he was supposed to be when he was drafted to be the succession plan. Right. You know, when they that was a perfect example of, you know, not drafting for need, drafting where you think you might need it in a couple of years. They took him despite having – um, Malik Jackson and Calais Campbell. And I was like, why are they? Why are they drafting another one of these guys? They needed him, and he hasn't. Like, they just you know, they haven't got it right yet. You know what's hilarious about it? it's just it's tough to predict this stuff. The Jaguars and the Falcons a few years ago were like the opposite of the whack a mole trying to fix my roster, and I just I can't keep up with all the holes. Hmm. There was a point. The reason why Fournette went to four in mock drafts that year. A lot of people put him there too and it wasn't just because it wasn't because they were like oh this guy's the fourth best player in the draft it was often because well the Jaguars have no needs they've just invested in the O-line and the receivers look pretty good and this looks pretty good other than quarterback that was the big thing a few years ago the Jags roster was really deep the Falcons roster a few years ago was really deep until it fell apart but both teams were like the, the team that was like tough to mock draft for because it's like, oh, where am I going to fill this hole? Well, first off, well, you don't want to just fill the need. You want to continue to add good players. And it looks like their strategy was good. We're going to add another three technique and Taven Bryan. Like, we're going to add these players, but they just haven't hit. And as they lose their veterans and they don't have their replacements, yeah. that's when it all falls apart. I'm not criticizing the Taven Bryan draft pick at all from Why a process not? standpoint. Like that, I think that was absolutely the right thing to do in that, as I say, they, they – Proved that it, panned out. Right. They proved that they needed that, right? Malik Jackson, Calais Campbell, those guys start to depart, and now is the time where Taven Bryant steps in, fills that void, and replaces them, only he hasn't been good enough. So I think process-wise, it was the right thing to do. It just hasn't worked out. They're also in this point, they add Tyler Eifert in at tight end. So it's like you've got Tyler Eifert, this veteran that you might only get one or two good years out of. Games. You, you pay a ton of money, or games, pay a ton of money for Joe Schobert, but the rest of the roster is screaming, maybe you're number one overall. I think they're going to stumble into four to six wins and be a you know top ten picking team again. That secondary one. has the potential to be a real problem, though. Yeah, could be poor there. Like so, interestingly, you those guys. DJ Hayden, 29th, has actually been way better in Jacksonville than he was anywhere else in his career. Like he was grading in the 40s, the 50s, just hit 60 
Oakland and Detroit. With the Jags, he's been like a 75 caliber player, which is reasonable. Like that's that's back to that um, Prince of Mukamara level of, hey, if that's a solid NFL cornerback. If you get that, there's real value there. Um, I Because we saw so many years of worse than that, though, I got, even after two, I'm still sort of like... You hate changing your I don't hate players. changing it. I'm just... It's like the Baker Mayfield thing, right? We have, what, four, uh, what, four, five years four of... Four out of five. Right, four yeah. out of five. Five years of evidence for him, four of which are good. Right. For DJ Hayden... We have seven years of evidence, and five of them have been bad. So, sure, it, we may have changed, but because we saw five years of awful, I'm still waiting for the other foot to drop or the other shoe to drop before I change my mind. If he has another season next year at the same kind of level as the last two, okay, fair. Fair enough. Jacksonville is different. DJ Hayden is actually like a half-decent cornerback. But, again, it's like if you're rolling into the season, I'm still just a little bit concerned about that. No, I mean, I, you should be, especially at cornerback. You should be. Right, and that's like he's their number one, which is the other problem, right? That is. C.J. Henderson is the other potential starter. Trey Herndon, like there's no other. Perry Nickerson has been acquired. Like there's no, there's no obvious this guy's definitely a quality starter there. D.J. Henderson is like – or D.J. Hayden, rather, is like the one that might be, and he has five years of awful tape. He was a pre-PFF college guy. Yeah. He was one of the weird – he was one of those guys that like Mayock out of nowhere – was like, yeah, DJ Hayden, top 10 caliber player. And right. everybody's like, what are you talking? Who? Yeah. Who what? Guy was hurt. He was there. Like, oh, yeah, NFL loves him, top 10. And he ends up going 12th or whatever to the Raiders. 12. And it was, I mean, he was bad I mean, yeah. for a while. And it was like, but that's why like, did that even happen? Yeah. That's what because, were you thinking? But that's like his mock being what people tell him. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, this was like, a, I mean, Whatever my recollection is. I mean, this was like right before the draft. A couple yeah, of yeah. weeks or whatever it was. Yeah, DJ Hayden, Houston. Right. That's the guy. Best corner in the draft. My favorite guy. <laughs> what? All right. What, what's a good season for the Jags? What should Jags fans be rooting for? I honestly don't know. Like, because this team is like set up for a Trevor Lawrence. You want Trevor or you want. Yeah. Lawrence. I mean, I guess that's I guess that's the ideal scenario, right? Is that this, that's a weird thing to be saying. Is that this team is so bad they get a Trevor Lawrence or a Justin Fields? But that looks like what this roster is aiming for, right? A total rebuild, a situation where you get the quarterback of the future. I just don't see how they get that with Minshew as their starter. And we love Minshew. Impressive Minshew last year. They've already gotten their money's worth out of their sixth-round pick. I mean, alternatively, the situation is that he takes a massive step forward. Let's put the positive spin on it. Okay. He takes a massive step forward. He, like, he gets better at all the things that were rookie quarterback problems – and suddenly, instead of saying, hey, this guy is Ryan Fitzpatrick 2.0, you're saying, hey, he can actually be cousins. Yeah, like he, he can be a quarterback we can build around. And instead of – like he's not costing us $84 million. He's costing us $7.62 on his six-round rookie deal for a while. So let's actually build around Minshew. And everybody develops. Yeah. And the Jags go to the playoffs. There is a world where Minshew is good enough for this team to actually embrace what he is and build around. It's Tom Brady. Sixth round, maybe not, maybe not that world. Tom Brady. All right, let's wrap it up. AFC South. How's your uh, laptop battery doing? Uh, we're at fifty nine percent. We're good. Oh wow! I, once you kill every program running, we and just have like two web pages open. This thing will, this thing will last. We haven't been long winded enough. Every player, every play, every game. It's the first time in like four months that I've had to even think about not having my laptop connected to the charger that sits on my desk. So I just never even crossed it's my really mind. really weird. I'm not in my comfy office chair. Right. You this morning, you're like, bring in the IFB that I'm not even using. You didn't mention the charger, which is the one thing Forgot that I, I, charger. I actually just, would have needed reminding to bring. I had no idea. I didn't remember how to like... When do I shower? When do I get dressed? When do I leave the house? I forgot to – I had to pack a couple snacks. By the way, sailing in this morning at like a regular human hour. Traffic's nice, huh? No, no traffic anywhere. If I – like if that was my commute over the past few years, they fixed the road over the bridge that they've been working on for like the two and a half years before. They moved the construction to my side of town. Perfect. Excellent. That couldn't work out better. Cincinnati under construction So the second forever. I – yeah, the second I don't need it, it's all done. Every when I was working in, coming in every day at eight a.m., gridlock, hitting that, hitting that traffic. So oh, that was a bummer. Anyway, the people want to hear about the Titans, not my traffic problems. Okay, they're running it back. Yeah, Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry, both locked up, Hall of Fame, long term. 
what are we thinking with the Titans this year? AFC championship participants yes. last year. So they were in a tough spot this offseason, right? In that because of what happened to them last year, being so good, going on such an incredible run, being so close to like really, you know, winning something at the end of it. It's a. It would be take. It would have taken an incredible amount of intestinal fortitude to come out of the end of that season and say, "We understand that what happened was essentially catching lightning in a bottle, and cannot be replicated. So we are going to stick to a process that actually will produce better long-term results. Therefore, we are letting Derrick Henry walk out of the building. We are franchise tagging Ryan Tannehill because God knows he's not repeating that." And we're going to like actually spend resources where we want to win long term. It would have been incredibly ballsy to do that. So they were in a really tough spot. On the other hand, I think the way they've gone about it is maybe the worst possible outcome that they could have done, which is really well, because they haven't even just like, let's keep one of them on the franchise so that we have the out when he inevitably bombs. Like they've locked both of them up long term. It's like, let's take the two unsustainable parts of this and invest big money into both of them, knowing that the chances of them regressing are pretty high. Each of them. I mean, we've talked about, could you be the team that goes year to year on quarterback? Yeah. And if you had just franchised Tannehill, there's your one-year guy. Oh, let's see if we can run it back. Let's see if we can – same system. Let's see. And then if it doesn't duplicate it a year from now, okay, maybe you, you grab Rivers for a year, you grab Newton, you grab Mariota back. I know, I know Mariota, Tennessee. But yeah. um, they could have done that. But they showed some loyalty. They locked up Tannehill. Once that happened, though, if they kept – I didn't hate Henry on the franchise tag because as long as it doesn't keep you from doing other things, like the franchise tag doesn't hurt you Yeah. if it's just for one year. <laughs> but then they lock him up. But then they locked him up again. So, so that's the thing, right? Like Ryan Tannehill was made for the franchise tag. What yeah. he did last season, absurd. He, he was the best graded quarterback in the NFL. Like he finished the season with the highest PFF grade of any quarterback – he made a massive difference to this team. His numbers were absurd. It was unsustainably phenomenal. I right? got some numbers we'll get into. Perfect. I'll get into the whole breakdown but, of Tannehill. But we know he's not going to do that again this year. They know he's not going to do that again this year. He is going to regress. The only question is how far, right? Because you, So Tannehill now has the spectrum in the NFL of best quarterback in the NFL, absolute disaster, and a baseline that was somewhere – in the middle, but probably below the halfway point of those two things, right? Like early Miami Tannehill looked encouraging and was going to be like a really good quarterback, and he just never took that step forward. And if anything, it went south yeah. all the way until that like final year of Miami, injured, busted, just awful. Then he comes in, he's like incredible, unsustainably good. So we know he's going to go down, but the point is where in this spectrum is he going to land, right? Because that's going to determine what you do with him. And I think because you, you have no real idea – you have to, you can't let him walk out of the door, right? What he did last year was so insane. Even I would not be like, look, <laughs> we know he's not going to do it again. Let's kick him to the curb and like roll the dice on a quarterback. Even I would be like, look, we, we're stuck with it. We have to keep yeah. him around this year and see what happens again. Just because maybe he will. Maybe he will. So franchise tag him, make him prove it when he can't, then do that. But instead, they used the franchise tag on Derrick Henry. Which, all right, you can debate whether that's the right move. But then they, they signed Derrick Henry, like, so they're not even using it. Like, <laughs> you didn't need the franchise tag to get Derrick Henry because you were going to sign him long term. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I honestly think that's the worst. You're getting frustrated. I just think it's the worst combination of outcomes they had available to them. But they are where they are yes. now. And for, for 2020, they're rolling it back. Yes. So I just want to explain why I think it's going to be difficult to sustain. Like, okay. what do the numbers say about Ryan Tannehill's sustainability? Mm -hmm. I wrote an article about the biggest outlier quarterback seasons of the decade. Mm -hmm. They were in order. This was outlier as far as PFF grade. The PFF grade and their actual performance being out of line with the rest of their career. Eli Manning, 2011. RG3's 2012, rookie year when he was mm -hmm. awesome. Cam Newton's MVP 2015. Carson Palmer's near MVP 2015, mm -hmm. and then Tannehill last year. And the thing, again, that our data has showed is that positively graded throws in our system are far less sustainable than negatives and then other uh, pieces of data because it's very intuitive football-wise. Positively graded throws 
are dependent on your receivers and your supporting cast and your play calling and these other things coming together. So Ryan Tannehill last year in positively graded throws ranked first. The previous year, he ranked 35th when he was our lowest graded guy in 2018. Like just using those two numbers, it's like, well, it'll probably land in the middle. Yeah. And if you're going to say, well, you know what? They're rolling it back. They still have Derrick Henry. They still have the play action game. Still have A.J. Brown. They still have Corey Davis. They still have Adam Humphreys. They have all these guys. John U. Smith. But the other guys that, re- you know, had these outlier seasons, Eli in 2011, uh, 2012, he was still pretty good and then fell off. RG3 had the same, same team in 2013 fell off. Cam Newton had pretty much the same group in 2016. He t- he fell off. Carson Palmer had the same group in 2016. He fell off. They all rolled it back with the same supporting cast and all that stuff and they couldn't duplicate that success. Well, you know, like part of the reason that's the case, you might be rolling it back, but everybody you're playing is different. Right? No, oh, yeah. as long as Absolutely. If every A, even if everybody else rolled it back and you literally just repeated the season. Football is such a wide variance game. Right. It wouldn't repeat. Well, even the number we showed earlier, like Deshaun, take three games out of Deshaun right. Watson sample size, he goes from an 80 to a 90. And so, the whole narrative on Deshaun Watson's different based off three games. If the entire league ran it back this year and you had a second shot to do exactly the same thing again, it would be a wildly different outcome. Right. And that isn't what's happening. You might be doing the same thing, but every team you're facing has had pretty significant roster turnover. We just talked about like all the additions, even within the division, like right. new guys in, new departures. The entire dynamic is different. So the fact that you're rolling it back with the same guys, it's, I mean, it's not irrelevant, but it's not like the only thing at stake here. It's not the only variable we're dealing with. So of course things are going to be different. No, I don't know. That, again, I don't know that there was like a better move as far as their 2020 roster, having Tannehill as quarterback, Henry as the running back, the same receiving core intact. There wasn't really a different move to make unless you say uh, maybe you could have spent some money to lock up Jack Conklin. Because yes. now let's get into the rest of the roster here. So that's a good question, right? If you had money to spend, would you have given it to Conklin or Henry? I didn't want to pay Conklin the money that he got, but mm-hmm. I'd rather pay him what he does. He's a really good run blocker and a reasonable pass blocker. I'd rather overpay for an above average tackle with that type of money, for sure, in Conklin. So now that they spend a first round pick on Isaiah Wilson, big dude, hasn't played football all that well at Georgia he's been pretty good <laughs> that's that's the that's the scouting report first round pick pure potential play Dennis Kelly is a better player right now he could be the starting right tackle Nate Davis was bad last year at right guard so the right side on the offensive line is a concern is a concern um core uh, AJ Brown looked like a star last year now again he could still be awesome this year, and he's probably not going to average 20 yards a catch. 20 yards a catch. Yeah. Like something's going to change there. He's not going to take the slant 92 yards again, right? Like those things aren't just going to happen again. But he's awesome. He's tough to cover. Corey Davis, probably not the Hall of Fame trajectory that we expected hmm. on this side of the table. Yeah. Uh-huh. But he's a pretty good number two. He's in his last year with Tennessee. They didn't pick up his fifth-year option. But as far as like a complimentary number two guy that can work some back shoulder stuff and some, you know, the vertical route tree, like he's fine there. And Adam Humphreys, when he's healthy, is a pretty good slot. And Khalif Raymond is a deep threat. And I, I like their receiving core. So like, can they produce again? Absolutely. But make no mistake, like they made the AFC championship and made this run because Tannehill played out of his mind yeah. after he took over. Tannehill played out of his mind and the offensive line really came together. Now, both of those things are a question mark heading into the year. Not because there's any reason to think that Tannehill will be dramatically better other than the fact that it just it's those things regress. Those things are unsustainable. So Tannehill's probably going to be worse. And we just talked about the, the right side of the offensive line is now a major question mark because instead of uh, Jack Conklin, who was a consistently good right tackle, we have Dennis Kelly and or Isaiah Wilson, who might not be. And if they're not you have the compounding effect of Nate Davis being not great inside. Now, maybe Nate Davis takes a step forward, but again, like this is guesswork. There's almost zero evidence of the fact uh, to say that he will be good next year or even solid. So what's really interesting is I think you can genuinely make the argument that Derrick Henry was like the most value add ball carrier last year in terms of like maximizing the things that a running back can do to impact yeah, he's been, rushing success, he's been right? Good. Yeah. But even like those NFL uh, metrics, you know, the yards over expected, whatever it is, based off the big data ball stuff, basically says that Derrick Henry was giving you like 300 yards 
over the season in terms of more than a repla- like more than an average slash replacement level player, right? How much does losing Jack Conklin take off that total? Like, because that's yeah, that, this probably, is the argument, right? Is yeah. that you can predict most of a running back's yardage based off what the picture is, the snapshot when you hand him the ball. So if you replace Conklin, one of the better run blockers in the NFL, with what cut the combination of of Dennis Kelly and Isaiah Wilson, like what does that on its own do to that over a season? I would argue it's pretty damn close. Yeah, they should run some numbers on each lineman, which you can't. We could, but. Um, Conklin top 10 run blocker last year so I think that's going right. to be significant um, anyway I mean I always look at offenses and say how tough is this team to defend I do think the Titans are in the top half of the league as far as difficult to defend because of AJ Brown I, I don't care running backs don't matter or not Derrick Henry's tough to tackle yeah he, he's not a guy that you're looking forward to like sticking your head in there I mean he and he and he has games where he goes off let's just let's just say that too mm-hmm. and that started like middle of 2018 you remember he, he stiff-armed Jack Collinsworth before the season Yes. They did their little run. TV. Henry wasn't running all that well. At the time, like, Jack needs to go back and maybe he needs to run it back against Derrick Henry. Because hmm. when he took the Derrick Henry stiff arm early in 2018, he wasn't running all that hard no. for that, like, little segment. It was, like, the middle of 2018, that Thursday night football game against the Jags. The Jags, yeah. Where it was, like, the switch flipped. And you're like, oh, you're now running, like, a 260-pound beast uh, with power and speed. And he's had these high-end games in the last year and a half. Um, so I, I think there's value in that in isolation. I don't think it's like, oh, he's the dude where the whole offense runs through for 16 games. I think it's like two or three games a year, including the Ravens game in the playoffs. He's running over Earl Thomas. Like, there are some big plays there. Um, I think that makes the offense tough to defend, meaning every week it's the pass game, but there'll be a couple times when Derrick Henry, yeah, he can take over. He can do that and create. Um defensively I think they've been the Titans in a really good position with at least three good corners for the most part a Dory Jackson Malcolm Butler they lose Logan Ryan who's just been a good solid player that brings me to Christian Fulton their second round pick I've called him the most important draft pick in this draft or one of the most important because I think Tennessee's ability to cover and be three deep and maintain that now they added Jonathan Joseph since that time who's you know our age and still playing well younger than us younger than us yeah Gosh. <laughs> they could be rolling four deep at cornerback i feel pretty good about they're not all great but they're solid Adoree's really emerged as one of the better corners in the league i think that's huge this secondary has a chance to yeah to give them the opportunity to go back to the afc championship christian fulton i think is one of the best fits schematically in terms yeah. of like pick in the draft i think that is a perfect landing spot for him kevin byard has been one of the best safeties in the nfl over a number of years he's awesome amani hooker could i think replace kenny vaccaro and potentially become that and then at sudden all of a sudden like the entire secondary is good and that's huge in terms of being like an elite unit back to this sort of sum of your parts being greater than the the, the individual pieces if you have five guys that are all solid at worst you have or six even if you want to go deeper into the cornerback group you have a, an incredible secondary um, up front, it could be interesting as well. Like if Jeffrey Simmons becomes the beast that he's flashed the ability to be, yeah. that's a huge thing for them because they've got players on the edge. Uh, Rashawn Evans has started to develop and started to take strides forward. If he takes another step, that's huge. And then you've just got the weirdness of Vic Beasley and whatever's going on there. R- Rashawn Evans is funny because we I've seen – some people on our little Twitter sphere talking him up as having a great 2019 season. The grade wasn't great there. Have been asked about asked about it before. He missed 18 tackles last year, and I went back and looked at some of his, you know, poor plays and coverage. I think here's part. I think why it's tough to evaluate linebackers is people don't always count the passes that go behind a guy. Yeah, that was Evans a lot. He's really good working downhill. He's really good keeping the ball in front of him, making plays. He makes flashy plays on screens and again stuff in front of him. This is the linebackers in this draft class. Kenneth Murray, Patrick Queen, great moving forward. It's the stuff behind them, right? You need to get depth. You need to you know, prevent the 20-yard dig route and things that look like they might be on the secondary when it's really the linebacker. That's where I think Evans was really struggling coming out of Alabama and has struggled in the NFL level, and that's where I think he's still lacking from a coverage standpoint. Plus, you know, he missed 18 tackles, as I said. He's that's also – he's the kind of guy where when you put on the tape, it just looks cool. You know what I mean? Because he plays with That's, this sort of yeah. reckless violence and hard Juan. impacts, and yeah, yeah. You know what? It's it sort of reminds me like when like, 
power sliding a car looks awesome, right? But it's not the fastest way around a corner. Yeah. Like you don't see Formula One drivers with the back out sliding the back wheels like smoke billowing off the ass end, right? Like those are drift cars. Formula One doesn't do that because that isn't the fastest way around a corner. Right. Like Rashawn Evans is power sliding every single play, like smoke billowing behind him, just a human like wrecking ball but it's not necessarily the most efficient way of playing linebacker. Like you're not, ne- you're not always in the right place, hitting the right guy at the right time. So I, I think he looks better than he actually is when you just like turn on the tape and are like, well, this just looks awesome. Mr. Analogy, you still have it. Jayon Brown, though, is a pretty good coverage play. I mean, so again, the, yeah. I think the back seven, and if Evans and Brown are just playing their specific roles, they bring something to the table, the back seven's solid. I mean, that gives that and the pass game – even if Tannehill is 80% or 70% of what he was last year, this team has a shot. Yeah. And well, they're right up there, I think, with Houston as far as – the and Indianapolis. I mean, the top three teams, how hard could it be? <laughs> and one of them, they're, they're going to beat each other up, win nine games, win so the division. That's the question, right? How good do you think that Tannehill is going to be? Because I don't want to – like, I, everything I've said about the Titans so far has basically been negative. I think they're actually a decent team. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think that defense is in pretty good shape. I think the offense is in pretty good shape. My only – my, my criticism is, is essentially process, right? I think they will be good in 2020. I yeah, your don't process think, is future-driven. I don't think they'll be better than they were from the point Tannehill came in last season and went on a run, and therefore I don't think they've taken a step forward to be able to beat the best teams in the AFC, right? That's my yeah. criticism. I think they'll be good. I think they'll be chasing a playoff spot. I just don't think they can beat the Chiefs, the Ravens, or any better equipped to do it than they were a year ago. Yeah, and I don't want to be completely negative on Tannehill either. I'm just trying to let right. you know where the numbers. So, are how good do you from. think he's going to be next year? I would still lean toward he's not like again in Miami for in PFF terms, he's a 70 to 80 quarterback. He's a 70 grade to an 80 grade. His 2018 was a disaster on the negative side yeah. where he got so lucky statistically, and he graded like 45. Like that's not Tannehill. Last year he was a 91, 92. That's not really Tannehill either. So. If he goes back to Miami Tannehill, he's 70 to 80. And when you ran, when you land in that range, your statistical outcome could be all over the place. It's dependent on your dudes around you. They've got some dudes that can make plays if A.J. Brown is, you know, remains and Corey Davis is Hall of Famer and contract year. What if Corey Davis has a Devontae Parker type year? You know, fifth-year option type stuff. So, anyway, I think they're going to be okay offensively and they're going to have a good passing offense. But the difference between a 90-grade Tannehill and an 80-grade Tannehill or an 82 or an 83, like, literally is, like, two or three games. Yeah. Well, 80 80 is a really – it's a great number to pick for this, Steve. Well done. Um, Because 80 last year puts you in that range of Derek Carr, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Jimmy G, and, yeah, all of whom sort of (laughs) – all of whom were disappointing. You know what I mean? Ready, here's – like here's, the narrative about those guys is this was not great. And here's exactly what happened there. Jimmy G, perfect system, perfect everything, mm-hmm. extremely productive passing offense because of everything around him. Brady, terrible playmakers, production was terrible. Rodgers, not good playmakers, weird style, yeah, not productive. Derek Carr, super conservative, stats were fine, but not playing winning football because he's checking down, down 20. Mm-hmm. I mean, so they all graded the same – with different stuff around them and different styles that led to different outcomes. Did you see that chart that Timo put out? I did. Derek Carr? It's perfect. Yes. It really is. I've, I stole that from my article on Carr today. Did I wrote one. PFF.com, you know, go check it out. Carr saying, claiming he's tired of being disrespected. I was like, he's not disrespected. He's respected the appropriate amount for oh, the, yeah. the way perfect he's played. Respect. But that chart is perfect, right? It's this idea that the the uh, your average depth of target should change depending on what the down and distance is, right? How far you have to go to convert a first down. And when you do any other quarterback, it does. When you do Derek Carr, it's like a straight line. (laughs) He is the passing equivalent. Do you remember that old adage for running backs? Like, if you need one, he'll get you three. If you need five, he'll get you three. Yeah. Like, that's Derek Carr for passing. If you need four yards, he's going to get you seven and a half. If you need 15 yards, he's going to get you seven and a half. Well, we'll talk about it when we get to the Raiders, man. I'll be begging for Derek Carr to watch Matthew Stafford tape from last year. And do that. I'm not rooting for anybody. I just I would love to see that. Carr's got all the ability to not be the guy that only gets you three when you need five. Yeah. He's got it in him. He's very sensitive though. Talent wise. I'm blocked. Oh, you're blocked? Because know, his brother Darren runs his account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, I showed like a family of them. 
I tweeted out because you and I, you and I love to. We just try to explain what PFF does sometimes. A couple years ago, I think it was 2018. Carr was in the middle of that like 10 game streak where he hadn't thrown a pick. Yeah. In that stretch, he had like three passes. I think we graded as minus twos, like the worst <laughs> you could have that fell incomplete. I'm talking like from me to you. I'm just gonna throw it right to your chest, and you dropped it. I'm not blocked. I'm blocked. Nope. I'm um, so I I wrote I wrote from a PFF standpoint. Hey, look at these passes that Derek Carr threw. He's uh, he's uh, ten games. Yeah, no interceptions. But like these things happened during the ten games. So who cares about this streak? Mm. And then his brother. You know what he did? He SpongeBob to me. His brother. He went SpongeBob text text on me. Oh yeah. Hey, the caps and the no. You know, yeah, yeah. He SpongeBob me. Huh. Yeah. And then all the Austin Gale Raiders fans of the world just attacked me. Yeah. Got attacked. You know. So. The other thing I use for this article, it's not a tremendously flattering article on Derek Carr. It's like, much like Kirk Cousins is known for like, what did he do? Take a knee instead of spiking it? Press the wrong button, essentially, in Madden? Carr like, gets the that's what he's known about. Down. Whereas, And now Carr is known for throwing the ball away on fourth down. Like, it, so his, his interception week one against the Rams last year, too. I, I tweeted it out. I get it retweeted every now and again because people find it. Yeah. When he had no pressure and he just, like, panicked and threw it up right to the corner. Right. Bad. Like, it's, he's got a couple of those that are just bad. It's really unfair to sort of essentially sum up a guy's entire career in one ridiculous play. On the other hand, like, when you're trying to make the case with guys like Cousins and with Carr that, look, the stats are great and the grade isn't bad and it's how the grade is compiled. And there's this feeling that, er like, when things matter and in the end, when the chips are down, like you need your – that's when your quarterback – that's when Joe Montana goes yep. on his run, throws five touchdowns, doesn't, you know, get a thing wrong, and drags them back even though he's already thrown four interceptions earlier in the game, right? right. Everybody knew that when the chips are down, Joe Montana's going to win them the game. Everybody knows when the chips are down, Kirk Cousins and Derek Carr are going to press the wrong button and do something <laughs> ridiculous. Like it's just like, – it's, it's unfortunate, but like that kind of is you. Yeah. And they both have great individual moments throughout the – it's not – again, it's not every time. And even the grade. Like, overall, yeah. their grade is good. Yeah. It's just that, like, the point is how it, how it is compiled and what happens the in the key situations. The great construction is, is – yeah. yeah, absolutely. We'll get back to Carr. We'll get it on the next episode when we wrap up the AFC. Anyway, Perfect. Titans, what are you expecting this year? I, I honestly – I think they'll be good. Like I say, I, I, this, is, this is a team that should be chasing double-digit wins. Let's and the division and the, the, the division like the, let's the crown. What the hell is the like the? They should win the division. Title? Yeah, there you go. Title. How hard could it be? First place. Let's remind everybody that the Titans with Marcus Mariota at the helm. Our, go listen to our previews over the last couple of years. We were probably like solid, solid team, solid team, nine and seven team. That's what they are. Solid. They're just solid. They're solid. They're good here. They're good there. They're solid. That's the Titans. What made them not solid? was simply Tannehill playing like the best quarterback in the league. If they regress back into solid 9-7, and seven, which might actually win the division with, between them, Houston, and Indianapolis, I wouldn't be surprised. They're still solid. Yeah. Good team. 9-7, and 10-6. and six. I, I mean, I think you've nailed it in terms of the outlook for this division, right? Those three teams, Houston, Indianapolis, and Tennessee, should be fighting to win the division. Jacksonville should be fighting for the number one overall pick, but They'll will probably playing. win six games They'll because be of Minshew. Spoiler. Right. So, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? Those three teams, I don't know that there's a standout amongst them, which means all three are probably going to land in the sort of seven to, seven win, seven to ten win range. Yeah. Whoever, like one of them is going to take the division crown because of it. They're probably, gonna, they're probably going to beat each other up enough that the, the wild card isn't coming out of this division. And my prediction is that somebody's going to look back at Minshew and the Jags as spoiler for their season. One of those, one of those three teams. God, they got Minshewed. All right, that's it, AFC South. How hard could it be? We're nice and quick. Back in the new studio, every game player mm. play. You would start from the game, and it's like, hey, we cover every game here right. at PFF. There was a logic Then to we that. also cover every player. Yes. And then we also get to this really granular level every single play. Mm -hmm. But you know, we are what we are. Yeah. Every player, every single one of their plays, yeah. and in every game. It this, can, we could work it either way. This is also not like necessarily the final studio setup. We're we're tinkering, we're playing, we're experimenting. So brand you know, new. You know the hashtag. Let us know. Let us know. Yeah. What you think? It's brand new, so we'll see what it looks like. I don't. Also, I don't take, have. We're gonna take guesses. How much weight do you think Sam did put on? God, it's a lot. I don't. I also don't have the posture. 
to be sitting in this seat no. for like hours at a time. No. Not only do I not have the posture, but the bad posture I do have is tremendously unflattering when it comes to the amount of weight I have put on in the off season. The best pods for you, I think, was when we took over Chris's office and you were just that like was slouched. Good. That was the, nice. Yeah. Nice. That was nice. Chair. And the ones we had in the old studio with the comfy chairs and the desk and the lean back thing. Yeah, that was good as well. Still be on camera. I'm a bit like if that's that should be my real like. I like a lean. If I can lean in the chair at the time, I'm happy. Can we get a chair that leans around here, please? Yeah. Someone? All right. You've seen the... Uh, we'll be back Thursday. Yeah. AFC West. What? Huh. I was going to say, have you seen like Joe, you Joe Rogan setting up his new podcast? And he's got these like weird ass T-shaped chairs, you know, like the ergonomic things. You gotta, we're not getting those. No. Once you make Rogan money, maybe. Yeah, okay. I want one of the chairs from The Voice. Yeah. Once it spins around, you yeah. press a button, it spins around. It's have you ever pass. sat? Have you ever sat in one of those Eames chairs? You know what those are? I don't. You don't know what they are? I mean, if I saw it, maybe. So yeah, you you know what it is. It's, it's like the thing. So leather, leather sort of uh, L-shaped reclining thing, but the back end of it is like a swept veneer, fancy looking wood. I haven't sat in one of these. No, but you know what they are, yeah, right? See, yeah. Yeah, it's like the famous designer chair that yeah. somebody has up on a plinth in their fancy instead of a Peloton. That's where you would put your Eames chair. <laughs> Um, yes. I've never sat in one of those, but they look comfy as hell. Do That's we what we need. Eames chair around it? Two yeah, of them. Two Eames chairs, yeah. Yes. You, you need like a special one made, but two Eames chairs. We have our demands. Yeah. Please meet them by uh, Tyler, Thursday's can you, pod. Can you relay that to David, please? Thanks, guys. We'll see you. All right, now we're done. Yeah. We'll see you Thursday. Bye-bye.